Now, before we begin our course on serverless framework, let's discuss on what serverless is. So serverless computing is a cloud computing model in which the cloud providers allocate machine resources on demand and take care of servers on behalf of the customers. So when we think about serverless, we generally think about services like Lambda, if you're working in AWS or Function App, if you're working in Azure or Cloud Functions, if you're working in GCP, but that's not true. You can also include tools like SQS, SNS, if you're working in AWS or other application integration tools, if you're using the other cloud providers as well. So these gambit of services also come under serverless and also so does the S3 bucket and all the other storage related capabilities that are provided by cloud providers. So serverless not only means compute like Lambda and functions, but it also includes integration tools and storages. So that's one thing you should keep in mind of when you're talking about serverless. So as long as the service allocates machine resources on demand and the servers are taken care of by the cloud providers themselves, then that particular service can be termed as serverless. So now let's talk about the features of serverless. The first feature of serverless that makes it, that makes it very appealing is zero administration. So here, once you have your service set up, you do not have to worry about your server whether it's working, whether it has been patched, etc., etc. All those administrative tasks are taken care of by the cloud providers themselves. So that's one very important and very key feature of serverless. So this is a very important feature of serverless. The lookup, the administration of the infrastructure is taken care of by the cloud providers themselves. The second key feature is auto scaling. So auto scaling makes it possible for you to ramp up your infrastructure as per needs. So as your application keeps growing in size, then serverless application will auto scale and it'll use extra resources or extra infrastructure to make sure that your application is running properly. The third important feature of serverless is pay as you use. So you only pay for the resources that you have used. So let's say that you have used your Lambda application for a particular period of time. So you only have to pay for that particular period of time and not more. So this makes it quite cost efficient as well. And the fourth most important feature of serverless is increased velocity. So now that because your application has zero administration and it scales seamlessly as per your needs, it's possible for you to develop an application in a shorter period of time than you would have had to if you were not using serverless. So these are some of the key features of serverless. So on this particular slide, I have pasted a link. You can go check out that link and see the need for serverless and see all the features that are available in serverless. So now that we know what serverless is, now let's look at some of the disadvantages of using serverless. Now these disadvantages are only applicable for the compute services that are currently available. So this includes services like Lambda, App Functions, or the cloud functions that are available in GCP. So the most important disadvantage is performance. Then there are the resource limits, monitoring and debugging, and the vendor lock-in and security. Now I have marked them colored as red and yellow. Now the yellow ones are probably disadvantages that can probably be bettered later on. So monitoring and debugging tools currently are quite rudimentary in some of these services, but gradually they will get better. So now let's look at some of the more critical problems of using serverless. The most important problem is again, like I said before, performance. And this is related to a co concept called cold start. So now let's look at what cold start is. Now the most critical aspect of performance is a concept called cold start. So the cold start can be defined as the setup time that is required to get a serverless application up and running when it is invoked for the first time and within a definite period. Now cold starts are something of an inherent problem that is applicable across all cloud platform providers. This includes AWS, Azure and GCP. So now based on a few parameters, your cold start can increase or decrease. So the increase in cold start would inherently mean an increase in latency and a decrease in performance of your application. Now the two most important factors are the code size and the language used. So the more the larger the code size of your application, the greater the cold start would be and the lesser the performance or the latency of your application will increase. 
Now, similarly, another important factor to consider is what kind of language you are using, whether it's a compiled language or an interpreted language. So in the next slide, we will see the difference between using a compiled or an interpreted language. Now in AWS and Azure currently, there are ways to overcome cold start. AWS, AWS has a concept called provision concurrency. And in Azure, you can use a premium plan and above to overcome cold start. However, these are expensive ways to overcome cold start and it would cost you more and it would cost you more to use these services. So now let's look at what cold start is in a more diagrammatic way. So the cold start is basically the loading of your code as a zip file, then the creation of a container and then after that loading the runtime for your particular application to run. So these two combined together for, form the cold start. Now, as I said before, the larger your code size, the greater the cold start would be. And also another factor is whether you're using a compiled language or an interpreted language. So the compiled language would take more time to compile that particular code. Whereas if you're using an interpreted language, there is no concept of compilation of code. So that results in a lesser code start if you're using an interpreted language. Underneath is a diagram to show you the difference between an interpreted language and a compiled language when it comes to the code start execution time. So if you look at a code like Java, you can see that the cold start is around initially around 300 millisecond. Whereas if you're using a node based application, then it's around 3.5 to 3.75. Now there is a very good blog for this particular concept of cold start that I have linked in this particular slide. I will also mark this particular URL in the resources for this particular section. So please go through this and understand what the concept of cold start is. And this is a term that will come up across all platforms. And it is something that is not going to go away anytime soon. So now the other disadvantage of using a serverless application is that you have limited time and limited memory. That is because you wouldn't want your serverless application to be running forever. You would only want to run or execute small chunks of code for a limited period of time with a limited memory. Now, even though this is not a disadvantage, but this is something that you should be aware of. For example, at this moment, if you're using an AWS Lambda, your function cannot run for more than 15 minutes. Similarly, if you're using Azure, your function cannot run for more than 10 minutes. That is if you're using the consumption plan. These are different for the other plans, however. And similarly, if you're using GCP, the maximum that your code can run for is nine minutes. And the same is the case with the memory as well. The maximum memory that AWS allocates for a particular Lambda function is 10 GB. And for Azure, it's 1.5 and for GCP is 4 GB. Now these are limits that will keep changing. And if you look at this slide and if you see that the numbers are different, that's probably because those numbers have been changed. So I would imagine that these numbers would keep increasing. That is the time limit would keep increasing and so would the memory. So another disadvantage of using serverless is that you have lost control over your hardware and the runtime. And what eventually happens is that you end up using other proprietary cloud specific tools. They were making it difficult for you to move out of your of that particular ecosystem. So let's assume that you've created a Lambda application. Now you would want a trigger like an S3 bucket or an SQS or an SNS. So you would use that. You would also use other services like EC2, Aurora database, etc., etc., to make a complete application out of your particular Lambda. So once you have done that, you've basically created a application which uses proprietary cloud specific tools for AWS. And once you've done that, it's next to impossible for you to change from AWS to let's say you want to migrate to GCP or Azure. So this is something that you have to be aware of. You should be aware of the fact that once you are stuck in AWS, then you're stuck in AWS forever because of the fact that you would be using other proprietary, proprietary cloud specific tools along with your Lambda. So that's again something of a disadvantage if you're using serverless. In this particular section, you will learn what serverless framework is. The difference between using serverless framework and other frameworks. And also finally, you will understand the disadvantages of using serverless framework. So serverless is basically a framework that is used for creating serverless application. And in GCP, 
a serverless application is centered around cloud functions. So that is basically the function as a service provided by GCP. So serverless can be also termed as a very specialized infrastructure as a code tool. It is different from other tools like Ansible and Terraform in the sense that you can only create serverless applications out of them. So there are two terms that you should get familiar with when you're talking about serverless framework, that is the events and the function. The function here refers to the cloud function and the event here refers to all the triggers to that particular cloud function. So the events can be of multiple types. The most common ones are the HTTP events and the other specialized events. The other events include storage, PubSub and Firestore. Now GCP cloud function is a relatively new service and the event range is not as elaborate as compared to the AWS Lambda event service that is provided. And this particular catalog of events I am sure will keep further increasing as time passes by. So let's look at a very basic serverless application that you can create. So every serverless application will always consist of two files, the serverless.yaml file, which is basically the configuration file in which your function and your event will reside. And then there is, there is also the JS file that will contain the code for your particular cloud function. So let's look at a serverless.yaml file. So the serverless.yaml file will contain a provider. Now this provider is based on which particular cloud you are using. Now since I'm using the Google cloud, the name of the provider will be Google. The rest of the parameter is something that I'll explain later on in the course. The second thing is the function. So each function will always have a name. So the name of this particular function is first one. And then the event for this particular is an HTTP event. So this particular function will be triggered by an HTTP URL. And then the other thing to remember is that there will be a handler. Now the handler is basically a pointer to the code and that code would reside in index.js. So every time this particular application is deployed, it converts this serverless.yaml and this particular index.js file into a cloud deployment manager template, which is which you see on your right hand side. So a serverless application is always created into a cloud deployment manager template. And it is this particular cloud deployment manager template that is uploaded into GCP and which converts your serverless.yaml file into actual infrastructure. So finally, let me just reiterate what I have said. So your serverless application will always consist of a serverless.yaml file. So this particular file is basically the configuration file in which you will define your function and your event. And it will also contain a handler, which is basically the pointer to your code, which would reside in the cloud function. And this particular serverless.yaml and your index.js, once it's deployed, will convert itself into a cloud deployment manager template. So a cloud deployment manager template is basically GCP's internal infrastructure as a code tool. And this particular deployment manager is uploaded into GCP and converted into actual GCP resource. So I hope this was a useful lecture. And that one thing you should always keep in mind that your serverless is always dependent on your deployment manager. So it is imperative that you know a bit about the deployment manager template if you have to be really good at working with serverless. Now here in this particular example, you can see that a serverless application, which is of just a few lines, if it has to be done in Terraform, it would take at least 30 to 40 lines to do the same. So that's the difference between using serverless and Terraform. If you're creating a serverless application, a serverless framework makes it very easy for anybody to create a serverless application. So however, the only drawback here is that you can only use the serverless framework to create such kind of serverless applications centered around cloud function. So now if you have architecture where you need to create virtual machines and cloud storage, then it's preferable to use a tool like Terraform. So the same is the case if you're using a tool like Ansible as well. So whenever you're using Ansible, the number of lines that you would need to create the SQL and serverless framework code would be much more. So finally, what do we conclude from this? We can conclude that for creating serverless application, it is best to use serverless framework, but for everything else, you should either use Terraform or Ansible. So why should you not use serverless? You should not use serverless if you have no experience with regards to deployment manager. 
Now to be a master at using serverless framework, you need to know a lot about Deployment Manager, which is basically the infrastructure as a code tool that is used within GCP itself. So that is a very major drawback that you have to consider. So you will eventually end up using a lot of Deployment Manager script in your serverless.yaml files, which we will see in the further upcoming lectures. And you should not use serverless if you are not creating a serverless application. So if you're creating an application for creating virtual machines and cloud storage buckets, then you should again, like I said previously, you should use tools like Terraform or Ansible. So now let's have a brief description about Cloud Function in GCP. Now Cloud Function is basically the function as a service that is provided in GCP. So to access GCP, you can either go to the hamburger menu and you can go to compute and underneath compute you will find, find cloud function so you can either access it through here or you can go to the search product and just type cloud function here so here you can see the cloud function dashboard so i had created a few functions earlier so to create a function is very straightforward in gcp you can just click on create function Here you just need to give the name for your cloud function and the region in which you want your cloud function to be. So the other important parameter here is basically the trigger. So how do you want to trigger this cloud function? So you can either trigger it using cloud function HTTP, either PubSub, cloud storage or cloud Firestore. Now I'll be using serverless to explain all these triggers individually. So these are the ways in which you can trigger cloud function. So let's start with the basic and let's start creating an HTTP trigger. And here you can see that there is a URL that is generated for you. Then you have an option of either having an unauthenticated invocation or a required authentication. So if you want a public URL that can be accessed by anyone, you can just click on allow unauthenticated invocation. You can click on save. And then let's click on next. Here you can choose your runtime. So you have an option between Java, Node, PHP, Python, and there are quite a few options, but it's not as elaborate as Lambda functions in AWS, and this currently does not have provision to have custom runtime. So it's a few generations behind Lambda, I feel, but still it's good enough. And then you have index.js and package.js. Here you can see that code. So this particular code just returns the hello world back to the user. So let's deploy this particular function. So let me just click on deploy. So if you're coming from a AWS Lambda background, if you're creating an AWS Lambda, and if you want to trigger a HTTP, then it has to be connected with a API gateway. But in GCP, that's not the case. You create a Lambda and you get a HTTP URL created with it. So you can see that my function has been created. So let me just open this. Now to trigger this function, you can go to the trigger tab and there is a trigger URL. So you can just click on this and it returns a hello world back to the user. So this is how you will use your cloud function in GCP. I hope this was a useful lecture. So in our previous example, I showed you how Cloud Function works in GCP. So why is there a need to use tools like serverless, Ansible, and Terraform? So there are benefits of using infrastructure as code. Some of the benefits are that it speeds up everything and there is simplicity. So basically, you don't have to manually create infrastructure and just by the use of a script, it can be done. So everything is simplified and there is no manual intervention required. The second most important reason why you should use infrastructure as code is there is always configuration consistency. Now, if humans were doing or creating infrastructure, there is always a possibility of some configuration misalignment that could take place. Now, because this is run as a script and the script is vetted, there is no possibility later on if you run the script again and again that it will produce inconsistent configuration. It will always remain the same. And because of the speed and the simplicity and the configuration consistency, there is always an increased efficiency in software development. So these three reasons basically contribute to infrastructure as code becoming very popular these days.
and rather than creating infrastructure manually it's done using code or done using scripts in this particular section you will learn the following you will learn all the tools that you need to install then you will learn how you can connect gcp to serverless and finally at the end we will create our first application so let's proceed and let's see what we need to do so now let's talk about all the tools that you need the first tool that you would need to install would be node.js so there is a link in this particular slide so you can go to this particular link and you can install node.js once you have installed node.js the second thing you have to install is serverless so to do that you can just run the following command this particular link i will give in the resource and in the description below okay so now that you've installed serverless the third thing that you need to install is basically the serverless plugin for gcp so again there is a npm install for that this particular command i will give in the resource and the description below as well so you have to install this as well okay we've installed serverless so that's the three things that you need to install to have serverless working with gcp in your local so first thing is you need to install node then along with node you'll get npm so you need to install the npm package for serverless and then you need to install the npm package for your gcp plugin so so i'll see you in the next lecture now let's see how we can connect serverless with your gcp account so there are two ways to do this you can either use your google account or you can use a service account now if you have to use google account you also need the g cloud cli to do the same so let's start by creating it using the google account first and later on we'll use the service account so for google account the first thing you need to do is you need to go to your gcp console so i'm in my gcp console the first thing i need to do is i need to create a user so let's do that i'll go to my IAM and then I'll go to identity and organization. Here I'll go to the admin console. So I'll go to manage user. I'm currently in my admin console. So the first thing I'll do is I'll create a new user. So I'll click on add new user. So I'll just call this serverless. Similarly here as well. And I'll call this user serverless at very lazy coders dot in. And I'll just give it give it a password. And click on add new user. Click on done. now let me go back to my gcp account so here i'm using the admin account so this admin account has basically ownership over this entire project so okay so now that i've created this particular user i'll go to iam i'll click on add and then i'll give necessary permissions for this particular user so if i click on serverless at very so you can see that that particular user comes in the drop down so i go to my serverless framework documentation and here it will give you all the permissions that you need for that particular user so these are the four permissions so let me just add these four permissions Okay, I've given this particular user all the necessary roles. So let me just click on save. So now you can see that this particular user has got all the necessary roles. So the next thing you need to do is you need to go to your console. Let me just clear the screen. And then you need to type this particular command. Now again, like I said previously, if you are using Google account, 
you also need to have gcloud cli installed so let me just copy this the link to install gcloud i will give in the permissions or in the resource in the description below so again i need to choose an account here i'll have to choose that new account that i've just created so i'll click on use another account i'll just click on next click on accept so now because this is a new account it'll ask you to create a new password click on cancel and here i'll click on allow and then you get a message like this that you are now authenticated with google cloud sdk and if you go back to your prompt you can see that you have been connected to G Cloud. And if you go back to your prompt, you'll get a message like this. So now here you will see that there is actually an error. So what it says is that you cannot connect to this particular project because this particular role is not yet there. So this is something new. So make sure that whenever you're creating a service account and whenever you're running that particular command to see if there is any error. So what this says is that this particular account does not have this particular user doesn't have service usage service use permission so let's add that as well so i'll go back to my admin so i'll add to service so i'll add to serverless at very lazy very lazy coders dot in that particular permission as well so again serverless and i need to add I need to go to service usage. And here I'll add the service usage consumer. I'll click on this, I'll click on save. And let me run that command again. So I'll again run gcloud auth application default login. Serverless, hit allow. Okay, so let's see if there's any other error. Okay, so at this moment, you can see that this particular project was added. So this particular credentials will let us access this particular project. So, so that's about it. So make sure that you always see if there are any errors while you're running this particular command. So once this is done, let's actually start creating an application and let's see how you can use this particular credentials. So to do that, let's go back to a serverless website. And let's do a and let's do a quick start. So let's click on quick start. And all that you need to create a new service is run this particular command. So let me just copy this. And now I'll go back to my VS code. And let, and let me run that particular command. So that command has generated a boilerplate. So you need to change it to my service and let's go to my service so if you open my service you can again see a serverless.yaml file and an index.js so let's open the serverless.yaml file so the first thing you need to do is you need to remove this credentials because we will be using the credentials that was just created so that credentials is in this particular path so it will be using this particular credentials and it will be doing it automatically. So you don't need to configure anything in your YAML file. The next thing you need to do is you need to change this particular my project. So this has to be the project that you want to access. So it has to be this particular project. So let me just copy this. And I'll paste it there. So the next thing you will see is that there is a plugin. So this plugin basically was something that we had installed in our earlier lecture and the name of the function is first and the handler is http so this particular http you will find in the index.js so if you open the index.js you'll find this http 
and let me just save this and again it's an http triggered cloud function that we want to generate so let's just deploy this particular function so to do that you just need to run the serverless deploy command so you can see it has generated an endpoint so if i were to open this endpoint And if I were to paste, it will it will throw me a permission denied error. So, so to make this particular URL work, you again need to go back to your admin account. You have to open that particular function. So this is my effect. This is the function that we just created. Currently, it does not allow unauthenticated. So we need to do that manually. So in the upcoming lecture, I'll teach you how within the serverless.yaml file itself you can resolve this particular issue. So for the time being, you can just go to permissions, click on add user, and here you can give all users permission to this particular resource. I'll click on I'll click on save now. Okay. I also need to give cloud function invoker. Click on save. Allow public access. Save. And let's just try to run this URL again. So you can see that it works now. So this is how you can use your Google account to create serverless application. So in the next lecture, I'll show you how you can do using the service account instead of the Google account. So I'll see you then. So in our previous lecture, you had seen how to create a Google account credentials JSON file. In this particular lecture, I'll show you how you can do the same using service account. So to do that, you can go to your IAM and underneath that, there's something called a service account. So you can open that. Click on create service account. Here you need to give a name for your service account. So I'll just call this serverless. Click on create and continue. Here you need to give the same permissions that you had given for your Google account. So let me just do that. So again, this user will have login admin, storage admin, cloud functions, as well as deployment manager click on continue and click on done and once you've created your service account all that you need to do now is generate a particular key for the service account so to do that you can go to actions click on manage keys click on add key create a new key click on create so this will create a .json file for you and it will download it for you Okay, so now I'm going to use the same project that I had used in my previous chapter, but the only difference is that I'm enabling the credentials key and the value that I'm going to put is basically the JSON file for the service account. This particular file, I have renamed it as keyfile.json and I have put it on my current folder itself. So the only difference now is I can just again do the, so now I'm just going to do the serverless deploy again. Okay, so you can see that the particular serverless function has been deployed. So this is how you use service account to create applications in serverless. So let's talk about a few more commands in serverless. The first command is called serverless package. This serverless package creates the artifacts that are needed by GCP to, re to create the infrastructure. So that is basically within this particular folder. So if I remove this particular folder, and if I run a serverless package, it creates the serverless folder so what it does is just creates the dos serverless it just it does not deploy it to gcp so when you run a serverless deploy that is when the dot serverless folder is deployed to gcp so the serverless package just creates this particular artifact so the content of this artifact and what they mean will be explained to you in the next section another important command is the serverless invoke command. So using the serverless invoke command within this particular prompt itself, you can deploy or should I say you can invoke any function you like. So in our serverless.yaml file, we had deployed this particular serverless folder and this particular folder has got, has got one function called first. So let's try to run this particular or should I say invoke this particular function in our local. Again, the command is serverless invoke hyphen hyphen function and then the name of the function which is first so let's try to run this
So you can see it returns the hello world. So this is the same text that you would see in your index.js. So it is this particular text. So this is a good way of running your function locally. And the third most important and the third and the most important command you should remember is the serverless remove command. So this removes all the infrastructure that you had created when you did a serverless deploy. So to make, so make sure that you do a serverless remove after you finished with your work so that you don't incur any extra charges. So that's about it. These three commands will always come in handy and make sure to remember them. In this particular lecture, you will learn about the internal workings of serverless deploy and you will learn how closely related the deployment manager of GCP, that is the native infrastructure as a code of GCP is with serverless. So in this particular section, we'll learn about what happens when we do a serverless deploy. So when we pop the hood of serverless, when we do a serverless deploy, we understand that serverless creates a cloud deployment template, which is then uploaded to GCP. Now, what is a cloud deployment template? Cloud deployment template is basically the internal infrastructure as a code that is used by GCP to create infrastructure. So let's look at a live example of that. So again, I'm back in my project. So let's see what happens when we do a serverless deploy. So the first thing you see is that it creates a dot serverless folder. And in this particular folder is basically the cloud deployment script. So there are two scripts created. First, there is the create script, and then there is the update script. And then there's also a zip file, which contains the code for the cloud function. So let us wait for this particular deployment to finish. Okay, so the deployment is over. As you can see again, that there were two deployment templates that were created. Now let's go look at them one by one. If you look at the first template, you'll see that there was a bucket created. So what happens initially is that there is a bucket created by this particular name and it's created in US central one. And within this bucket is basically the code that we need deployed to the cloud function. The code resides in this particular folder. And after the folder and after the bucket has been created, deployment template is updated. And then again, what you see here is another resource is added to this particular template. And this time the resource added is basically the function. And within the function again, you can see that there is a name for this function. And this is the particular name for that function. And again, the other important thing to remember is that the code for that particular function resides within this particular bucket. So that is exactly what happens when you do a cloud deploy. It creates two scripts, the create and the update. The create creates a storage and stores the code within it. And after that, that particular create template is updated. And then the function is added to that particular deployment template. And along with that, your deployment is over. Now, if you want to look at this particular deployment in GCP, you can go back to your console. And within that console, you can just click on deployment manager and click on deployments. So here you can see the same deployment that has taken place. So if you open this, you can see that there were two resources created. The first resource is basically the storage bucket and the second re resource is the function. And you can see all the parameters for that particular resource for both the storage as well as for the bucket. So once again, it's very important for me to reiterate that fact that whenever you do a serverless deploy, what happens in the background is basically the deployment manager script is run. And it is basically the deployment manager, which actually creates the infrastructure that is needed. And it is the, and, theref and therefore there is a close relationship between your deployment manager and serverless. 
So I hope this was a useful lecture for you. This will come in handy later because there are a few deployment manager script changes that you would want to do in your serverless.yml file. So I will discuss those details later on as we progress in this particular course. So now let's have a look at the anatomy of a serverless.yaml file. The serverless.yaml file is arguably the most important file in your serverless application and it contains all the configuration that you need. So the serverless.yaml file consists of the following. It consists of the service. The service just represents the name for that particular serverless.yaml file. So it is just an identifier, a name identifier for that project. Then comes the provider. So the provider in serverless is different for different cloud vendors. So the provider for Google has the following parameters. It has the stage, the runtime. So the runtime represents which particular runtime you want your function to have. The region, so which particular region you want your function to be in and the project. So this represents the project you want your function to be in. So this remains static and this can be changed based on your configuration. And then comes plugin. So this plugin remains constant. So for Google serverless, Google cloud function would be the plugin that you are using. And then comes the meat and potatoes of a serverless file. So here the functions represent the function name as well as the event that will trigger the function. So for example, here you can see the name of the function is first hyphen one and the event that triggers this function is HTTP. And the handler is basically the code or the path to the code for that particular function. And then for GCP, there is another very important. And then comes another very important key in our serverless file that is called the resources. So the, rep so the resources is basically a snippet of the cloud deployment template, which we can add in our serverless file. So I'll show you examples of how you can use your servers resources in your serverless.yml file as we keep doing more examples. Another important thing to note is the naming convention of our function. So the naming convention of the function is basically the amalgamation of the service name, the stage provider and the function name. So the service name, as you can see, is H SLS HTTP. The stage within the provider is dev and the function name is function first one. So you s concatenate all these three and then this is the name of the function that would reside in your cloud function. So this is something that comes in handy when you're adding snippets to your resource section of the serverless file. So that's something that we will see later. So that's it for this particular section. So when we are creating new projects, what happens is we generally have the tendency of creating all the events and functions within the same particular file. So if you look at this particular diagram, you can see that there are four events and functions and each of them are basically connected to one single handler.js file. Now this is a fine approach if your project is very small and if you are creating applications that are very small in size. But if you're creating larger applications, following a model like this, it becomes very inconvenient. Now another factor to consider is that your deployment manager template file cannot be more than one MB. So if you keep adding more and more events and functions, eventually that particular one MB threshold will be crossed and your deployments will start failing. So to avoid a scenario like that, what you can do is you can divide your project into multiple service or modules and you can have a microservice based approach. So for example, in this particular diagram, you can see that a project has been divided into different services. For example, the user service, the account service, the customer service and the sales service, and they have all been created using different serverless applications. So let's try to implement a project like this. So I'm in my PowerShell right now and I've created a folder called my application. And what we can do is within this particular application itself, we can keep creating more and more services. So the first service that I will create is basically my user service. And here it creates a folder called user service. And within this particular user service, you can add all the functions and events related to your user service. Similarly, you can do the same for other services as well. So for example, if you want to create an account service, so this will create an account service for you. So you can go to your account service and you can see that 
there is a separate serverless.yaml folder and there is a separate index.js so all the code related to your account can be included in this particular serverless.yaml and your index.js so this is how you should segregate your project to have a more microservice based approach in creating applications in the upcoming sections we'll talk about the events that can be used along with the cloud functions so there are four basic events the first is the http event then there is cloud storage events so these are events that can be triggered by cloud storage and then there are pub sub events and there are firestore events so so we'll be discussing each events one by one so let's start by discussing about the http event first in this particular section i'll talk about http events so there are two kinds of http events there is the authenticated and the unauthenticated http events we'll start by creating an authenticated http event we'll make a few setting changes in the serverless.yaml and we'll also learn how you can add environmental variables and finally we'll also see how you can run an authenticated http url so let's proceed so like previously let's use the serverless create to create a new service again the template is google node.js and the path is my new service so it will create a new folder by this name and the name of the project would also be my new service so let's create a new project Okay, so the new project has been created. So let's go to our new project. So let's go to a serverless.yaml and let's make some changes there. So the first thing I'll do is I will be authenticating using the Google account. So I can just comment this part and then I need to change the project. So I'll go back to my GCP console. I'll get the project name. So this is the project name. Let me just copy this. So initially that is the only change you need to make. So let's try to deploy this particular serverless application. So to deploy again, I use the serverless deploy. Okay, so this particular deployment has happened successfully. So the next thing we need to do is we need to call this particular URL. So if you call this directly, because it's an authenticated URL, it will give you a 403 saying that you do not have permission. So let's try to create a token so that we are able to access this particular URL. Now there are two ways to do it. You can either do it using tokens that are generated programmatically so there are a few libraries that you could use to do the same and then the other way of doing it is you can create these tokens manually so for that you need to run a curl command on the compute metadata server so let's do that so the first thing i'll do for this is i'll basically create a virtual machine and that virtual machine will have a service account that has access to invoke that has access to invoke your cloud function so let's do that so I've created an instance by the name of instance one and the instance one has access to invoke cloud function. So if you go look at the service account, so I'll just copy the service account. And if I go to my IAM, So I've explicitly given this particular service account to invoke cloud function. So let's try to log into this machine. So I'll be logging in using G cloud. So to do that, you can just go to your G cloud and click on run in cloud shell. So if you do this, you don't need an external putty or any other tool to do the same. You could do it within your G cloud browser itself. So let me authorize. So I'm logged into my instance one. So let me just copy this particular command. Yes, 
You can see that this command has an audience and this audience has to be populated by the URL. So I'll just remove this and I need to paste this particular URL that I got. So, so this is basically the URL to which I need to give permissions. So I'll copy this and I'll paste it here. And let me run this curl command in my instance one. So you can see that it generates a token. So I can use this particular token to log into my endpoint. So let me just copy this. So I've opened my Postman account. You could use any other API tool to do the same. So here I go under authentication and I choose bearer token. And here I just paste that particular token. And then I go back and I just copy this URL again and I'll paste it. So we are all set. So this is the URL and this is the token that I generated manually. So let me click on send. And you can see that I get a hello world. So this particular token has worked and I was able to log into this particular URL. So I hope this was a useful lecture for you. A few of the other parameters that can be changed in the serverless.yml file includes the memory size and the timeout. So the default memory size is 256 and the default timeout is 40 seconds. So let's just change this to 128 and let's change the timeout to 40 seconds. Or uh, let's make this 10 seconds because we don't need this function to run for 60 seconds. So, so let's just deploy this function again. One, one way to see whether your changes have been saved properly is you can go up to your serverless file and within the template update, you can see whether the available memory and the timeout is 128 and 10 seconds. So if this is the case, then you can be certain that once your deployment is done, the correct values will be populated. So the function has been deployed. Let's go back to a cloud function console and let's see whether the changes have happened. So the first thing you can see is that the memory allocated is now 128. So the next thing we need to see is whether the timeout, timeout has changed to 10 seconds. So for that, you can go to details and you can see that the timeout has changed to 10 seconds. So we were able to successfully change the memory and the timeout using just the serverless.yml configuration file. Another important variable that you can use in your serverless.yml file is the environment variable. So in this, you can add key value pairs that can be accessed by the cloud function. So here, for example, I've added a key value called test ABC and I've changed the index.js file as well. So in this index.js file, I just console log that particular variable test that I have defined in my serverless.yml file. So test, so this should basically resolve to ABC. So let us deploy this function and let's see what happens. So the deployment is done. So let's go back to our cloud console and let's see whether the changes are there. So I'm in my cloud console. If you click on the variables, you can see that that particular environmental variable has been propagated here as well. So let's test and whether let's see whether that particular console.log works. So I go to the testing tab and I click on test this function. So it returns a hello world and let's check for the logs and let's see whether that variable got passed properly. So you can see the value of ABC. So this is basically the value for the variable test. So you can see that you can also use the environmental variables or should I say you can also configure the environmental variables in your serverless.yml file. So previously we had learned how to create an authenticated URL. Now to create an unauthenticated URL is a little more tricky than it actually should be. That is because serverless with GCP is actually not as, as advanced as serverless framework with AWS or even Azure. So what we need to do is we need to add a few lines of cloud deployment template code so that you can make that particular URL unauthenticated. So to do that, what we need to do is we need to add within the resource section a few lines of code. So before we do that, let me try to 
explain to you what a cloud deployment snippet looks like. A cloud deployment snippet basically creates resources. Now these resources will have three properties, the name of the resource, what type of resource it is, and the property of that particular resource. So for example, if you want to create a type of instance, so that would be a virtual machine. So that virtual machine would have a set of properties. So you need to add those properties as well. So let's have a look at the example. So here you can see that the name of the resource is VM instance and it's of type compute V1 instance. And then within that you add all the properties for this VM instance. So you get all the resource types within the Google documentation itself. So you can browse and see all the resources, all the types that are available. And each of these types would have a set of properties associated with it. Apart from that, there is also something called as metadata. So if you go to the metadata section, you, you'll see that there is a field called depends on. So this actually explicitly adds a dependency. So for example, you want resource A to only run after resource B, then you can add a dependency in such a way that resource A will only run after resource B. Okay, so now this was a very brief overview of deployment manager. Let's go back to our code and let's see what we have to add. So again, this is the serverless.yaml and within the resource section, I have added one resource. The name of the resource is just my SLS binding. So this can be any variable and the type is of this format. And this particular format, this particular type has the following properties. So the first property is the resource. So this is basically the resource. This resource is basically the name of your cloud function. Like I had explained before, the name of the cloud function is based on the name of the service that is SSS-HTTP that you can see on the top. Then it is appended with the name of the stage. So the name of the stage you can see within your provider. And finally, the name of your function. So the name of the function that I've given is first hyphen one. So you combine all these three and you'll get the name of your function. So this is the resource. And then the role that you need to give is basically cloud function invoker and the member is all users. So what this particular type will do is it will make all users act, have access to this particular cloud function role invoker for this particular resource. So this basically makes this particular function publicly accessible via an HTTP endpoint. And again, this resource can only be created after your function has been created. So there is a dependency that this particular resource should run only after your function has been created. So I've added a dependency like this. So let's try to run this function and let's see whether this creates an unauthenticated URL. Okay, so the deployment has finally happened. Now let's see whether if we can access this URL. So let me just copy this. And again, let me just paste this. So you can see that you are able to access this particular endpoint now. So if I go to the I, if I go to my console again, let me go to my cloud function. So what has actually happened within the cloud function is, so if I open this function, if I click on permissions, you can see that this all users has been added with the role cloud function invoker. And that is precisely what that particular resource did. And that is precisely what that particular resource did. It created, a, it added the all users member and gave it access to the cloud function invoker, thereby making it possible for anybody to invoke this particular function. So I hope this was a useful lecture for you. Now there are four storage triggers that we can combine with our Google Cloud functions. Now these include the finalize, delete, archive and metadata update. So we'll start by talking about the finalize trigger. So the finalize trigger is called whenever there is a new object upload within a particular bu bucket. So this is the name of the event. So we'll be using this particular event. So again, this is a very basic code. So the name of my function, again, I'll just call it as first. The name of the handler is event. So event is basically just a hello world code that I have in my index.js file. And then the event type. So this is again the finalize. And this is basically the 
bucket. So this particular bucket is called serverless trigger bucket. So let's see what happens if we run this initially. So let me do a serverless deploy. So you can see that this particular deployment failed because it says that this particular bucket is not available. So you have either two choices. You can either create the bucket before you do this deployment or the other thing you can do is you can go to the resources and you can create a bucket here itself. So I have already created a resource and within this resource is the type storage v1 bucket and I have created a bucket by this particular name and it will again be in your central one. So let's see if you are able to deploy this now. So again, I'll go back and do a service deploy. So now you can see that this particular function has deployed properly. So let's go back and check the function. So the first thing we'll do is we'll see if the storage has been created. So you can see that there's a bucket called serverless trigger bucket. Now let's go and check out the function. So this is the function and you can see that the bucket that triggers is, is called the serverless trigger bucket. So let's try to upload something into that bucket and let's see whether this particular function is triggered. So again, again I go back to my cloud storage. I will upload a file. So let me upload an XML. I go back to my cloud function again. So if I go to my source, I am logging quite a few things. I'm logging the name of the file, the name of the bucket and the name of the event. So let's see if you're able to see all these in the logs. So if I go to the logs, so you can see I get the relevant information. So this is the event. This was the name of the bucket and this was the XML file. So you can see that the upload of that particular file caused this particular cloud function to trigger. Now the particular metrics currently takes a bit of time to update, but hopefully this should happen within a few minutes. So that's it for this lecture. I hope you have understood the importance of the resource section within your serverless.yaml file. So that can come in very handy, especially if you want to create resources. The other way of doing it probably you could do it as an assignment is so instead of using the resources section you could actually create that particular storage bucket and after that deploy this particular serverless.yaml file once again i'll be providing this code to you in the resource or in the description below so i'll see you in, in this particular example there will be a file upload using the object.finalize event type and once the file has been uploaded the cloud function will actually create a copy of this particular file and put it in another bucket. So, so basically the resource will have two buckets created. One is the source bucket, the other one is the destination bucket. And the source bucket has got the event type finalized. So whenever a new file is uploaded into the source bucket, the destination bucket will get a copy of that. So let's see how the code works for this particular architecture. So let's look at the serverless.yaml file. The serverless.yaml file, like I said previously, has got two resources. Both of these are buckets. Now this is the source bucket and this is the destination bucket. And they both reside within US central one. Now, if you look at the event, this event is triggered by object.finalize. So what this means is every time a new object is uploaded to this particular bucket, then there will be an event triggered. And the event will be triggered to this particular to this particular cloud function called first so let's look at the code for this particular cloud function which resides in the handler dot the handler file so it will be in index dot event so this is the index dot this is the code for that particular so in this particular piece of code we are calling the gcp api to copy the file so we are using the 
So we are using the Google Cloud library to do the same. Google Cloud Storage library to do the same. And here, if you look at the code at the end, what happens is basically this particular file is copied to this particular destination. So let's run this particular code and let's see what happens. So the code has been deployed. So let's go and check. So you can see that there is both the source and the destination. So what we'll do now is we'll create, we'll upload an object in this particular bucket and that particular object, a backup of that particular object should be there in this particular bucket. So let's do that. So let me upload a file. So I'll upload a CSS file, open. Now there should be a destiny. Now the destination bucket should have this particular file as well. So let's go back to the destination bucket. This is the destination bucket. You can see that the destination bucket gets that particular piece of file as well. So this is a way in which you can copy your source file into a destination bucket. So I hope this was a useful lecture. The code I will give in the description of the resource below. Now let's look at another example. In this particular example, the event type is delete. So what happens is every time an object is deleted from that particular bucket, the cloud function is triggered. So let's see how we can implement this. So to implement this again, let's create a bucket in the resource section. So this will be called serverless trigger bucket again. And here the only change you need to do is the event type should basically be of type delete. So whenever an object is deleted from this particular bucket that we create in the resource section, this particular event will be triggered. And everything else remains the same. And similarly, the index.js just displays all the attributes about the deleted file. So let's try to deploy this function. Okay, so the application has been deployed. So let's go and check this particular bucket. So again, let me copy this bucket. I'll go to my cloud storage. And what I'll do here is I'll upload a particular bucket. And now let me just delete this. So when I delete this, this will trigger that cloud function. So let me click on delete. Now, if I were to go to my cloud function now, so this is the function. And if you were to go to the trigger, you can see that the event type is delete and this is the bucket. So let's go to the logs. So we can look at all the attributes of the, so here, if you look at the logs, you can see all the attributes. So this is the event type, this was the bucket, and this was the file that was deleted. So this is how you can trigger a cloud function on the deletion of an object in a bucket.